So good morning again, everyone. Morning. I'm delighted to see you all here. And it's good for us to come every once in a while to see the faces of our family members. You see, CAH is not just a college. It's not just, you know, different departments coming together. But it's a family meeting together for one common goal. And today, that's to worship God, to know Him better and to understand how we can better serve Him by serving others. Now, if I ever get too excited and then I start talking so fast, just raise your hand and signal me to slow down, all right? So I want you to pay good attention to what God has in mind for you today. So before we start and dive into God's Word, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we claim your promise that you will open our understanding. So Father, we claim that promise in Jesus' name. Amen. Has any one of you ever asked this question? Why me, Lord? Anyone? Like raise your hand up high. Okay. Every human being has been built with the capacity to comprehend things. And one of them is this. These are one of the questions that people ask often. Why me, Lord? When you're going through something difficult, you ask God, Lord, why me? Why couldn't you go hit on someone else and go, you know, like my life is ruined. Why? Why would you do this to me? Let's take a look at other possible statements we might say sometimes. How many of you here have experienced this? My tears have been what? My food. What? How often? Day and night. Now, how many of you here have gone through this experience? Okay, so if we would go all the way back to, say, 3,000 years ago or farther, we see that this has been an experience. It's not something that's unique. But it's a common experience to all. Maybe not similar to what others are going through, but somehow you can relate to it. Let's take a look at another. I am what? Worn out from sobbing. Alright, let's take a look again. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. Have you guys ever gotten wet or drenched under the rain? You know what drenched is, right? That means you're soaking wet, there's nothing dry. Perhaps this has been your experience as well. Let's take a look at another. My soul is full of troubles. It's not just one. Full of troubles. That's plural. And my life draws near to the grave. How many of you have come to the point where you're like, what's the point of going on with life? It's a mess, everything is... My life is just crazy. Nothing goes right. Everything I do seems to be wrong. You're not alone. Let's take a look at one more. Oh, this is when it gets tough. I look. That means you're searching, you're longing for something. I look for who? Someone could be a close friend. Someone could be your mom, your dad. A trusted mentor, a trusted teacher. Mm -hmm. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. <clears throat> Do you even think sometimes, like, is there anyone who minds at all about my existence? Does anyone care? The verse goes on to say, no one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. No one cares, really. Perhaps you've even thought, maybe if I disappear suddenly from this world, like soap salads, no one will care, no one will mind. Are you really sure that's going to be the case? Let's take a look. Perhaps many of us have even asked this question. If, who is leading me? If God is leading me, what's the question? Why do all these things come upon me? Have you guys ever been so burdened you can do nothing but cry? 
Have you guys been so loaded with requirements that teachers load on you? And you're like, I can't see my way out of this. And you're like, I think I'm going to fail. And then you get to the point where you're asking, Lord, you led me here to AUP, and now everything is, why is everything going wrong? I thought everything would go smoothly. I thought I'd have a lot of friends. I thought, you know, my life would be better because I'm in AUP. But why is it that it's so hard to live one day at a time? We ask these questions. And it's good that you're asking these questions because it's an indicator that you want to live. Live in a way that's, you know, not boring, something that would give you excitement, something that would give you passion for what you really want to do. I'm sure many of you here have chosen a specific career because it's what you're passionate about. Others, maybe they were told to go there because of their sponsors or their parents. However, over time, you develop a love for a certain something that you're doing. Now, when times get hard, what would you do? When you don't understand what God is doing, are you going to give up on God? Are you going to say, there's no God, I don't believe in Him, everything is just a myth, it's just a fable, everything is just, you know, some belief, there's no tangible proof. Perhaps you've even asked those questions, does God really exist? Does He care for me? If so, why would a God of love allow his creatures to suffer? Why would a God who is just good, as they say he is, allow bad things to happen to good people? I'd like us to read this. Many who sincerely consecrate their lives to God's service are what? Surprised. When you're surprised, are you expecting it? No, right? When you're surprised, that means it's nothing that you've even thought about. Like, it just comes to you. Are surprised and disappointed to find themselves, as never before, confronted by obstacles and beset by trials and perplexities. It goes on to say, they pray for Christ's likeness of character, for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. You used to think like going to church is okay. You used to think that maybe if I do some mission trip or go serve other people, go to where the poor are, give them food, that's okay. But why is it here in AUP, like if I'm sitting in a class, I feel bothered, I feel like, ah, this teacher is something. Not good. Why does teacher give so many requirements? Ah. Or perhaps you're with your friends and they start bullying you because of something. Perhaps it's the way you dress, it's the way you look, it's the way your skin is toned. And then you're like, why, why do these things irritate me? Why are these things like, why do they seem to call forth the very worst in me? I thought these things were supposed to help me become a better person. So why? And then, here we go, it says, Faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect the existence. Many of us think we know ourselves, right? I know myself better than you, don't judge me. Many of us have that statement. However, do you really know yourself? Do you see yourself as God sees you? Maybe not. So here is the first point I want to make. In connection with that question, why me, Lord? Why do you allow these things to happen? The first thing I want you to keep in mind is this. Can we all read it together, please? Trials are God's agents for change. How long you here wants to live a better life? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to go through the process? Someone said, you have to endure the process before you can begin to see any progress. You can't go through something like, you know, just fly over troubles and, you know, jump over puddles. Eventually you're going to step into one. But what would you do? You have to keep going. Many of us here have a goal to reach, right? You want to pay back what your parents have done for you. You want to make someone happy. 
are you willing to go through the process in order for you to change? Are you willing to endure what needs to be endured, trials, maybe problems, just to get to where you want to go? <coughs> trials and obstacles are the Lord's what? Chosen methods. That means he's decided to use this <coughs> as his instruments to shape you to who he wants you to be. Which you have no clue even of what that is. But let's take a look at the next words. He who reads the hearts of men knows their characters better than they themselves know them. He sees that some have powers and susceptibilities which rightly directed might be used in the advancement of his work. One of the missions here in AUP is to restore man in what? In the image of God. And it's through what development? Therefore, right? Mental, physical, social, and spiritual. God wants to develop us in all of these aspects. But the thing is, many of us are too impatient to bear with the discipline of God. Many of us, instead of allowing the circumstances to shape us, to make us better people, we complain a lot, like, Lord, can't you just get over this? Can't you just, you know, give me an easy life? Everyone who is born into this world will not have an easy life. I'm so sorry. That's life. Life happens to everybody. And what matters is how you react to when life happens. I heard once from a retreat I went to, it says 90% or something is what happens to you and 10% is how you react to it. Oh, was it the other way around? 10% is what happens to you, sorry, and 90% is how you react to it. So basically, we are who we are because of the choices we have made. Again, you are who you are today because of the choices you made yesterday and the day before and the time even now. So who have you become right now? How many of us here have lived for like at least 15 years already? Do you have anyone younger here? Well, if that's the case, yeah, there's more troubles to come. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's reality. But what can comfort us during this time? What can give us that, how do I say this? What can inspire us to keep going? What can push us to, you know, even if it's hard, just keep going? What is that? Let's take a look. Okay. In his providence, he brings these persons into different positions and varied circumstances that they may what? Discover. If something has been discovered already, what's the point of going on? Life is a continual discovery. It's up to you how you go about that. Discover in where? Their character, the defects which have been concealed from their own knowledge. Now if God was to show you who you were today, I don't think any of us would live. If God were to show you the worst of who you are, you wouldn't think Hitler was bad. If he were to show you your hypocrisy, the lies you've told people and yourself, the lies you've believed in, who you are, I think we'd all say, like, Lord, please stop. There was a man in the Bible who was considered good and upright, and he was revered and respected by everyone. However, one day, there was this being who said, what, why do you keep protecting this guy, Lord? Why do you keep protecting Job? You have, you have protected him, you have given him everything, his life is good, he has no troubles. So, you know, why are you protecting him? But think about this, Lord. If you were to take away all those blessings from him, I think he would curse you to your face. And what does God say? All right? You want to try him? Okay, do this, but only this far. You see, when God allows trials to come into our lives, it's with His permission. 
Satan can do nothing more than just stand and, you know, be a monument or a statue unless God tells him, you know, you can, you can try this child of mine. You can try and see, you know, I trust him. I know he'll stay faithful to me. When God allows trials to come into your life, it's for you to see who you are. And when you realize that you need someone to save you from yourself, that's when God steps in. Many times, many of us are so caught up in ourselves, like thinking, I can do this, I am invincible, I'm like Superman or Wonder Woman or whoever, like those myths. And then we believe like we can do great things. That's not wrong. However, we can become blinded to our own weaknesses, which could be stumbling blocks to others. We don't want that to happen. We don't want to cause anyone to give up on life just because we did something that we were unaware of or ignorant of. So God, in His mercy, little by little, shows us who we are, that we may sense our need of Him. And then what happens when God shows us who we are? He gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. Often, he permits the fires of affliction to assail them that they may be purified. We believe that we're not just living for this world. We believe there's an eternity to come. And I wouldn't want to sacrifice 80 years, 100 years of my life for an eternity of pure bliss and happiness. I mean, in right here in this world, we are all seeking for happiness. But unless we have Christ, we cannot be truly happy. It's only temporary. This is the second point that I want to make, and I'd like to really share with you, is that God sees potential in you that no one else can see. Many people say, perhaps to you, you know, you could be a great singer, you could be like the greatest artist in the world, you could even be, say, the most fluent and powerful motivational speaker in the world. And you can change lives. You could be like Greta Thunberg and, you know, like shake up all the politicians and make a change in the world. People's conceptions of who you can be is far below what God desires you to be. And if you want to know what God thinks you should be, well, I think it's time to discover here. If you want to know your purpose in life and your direction, you have to go here. Does anyone here have a car or, you know, some motorcycle? So before you get that, you go through a training, right? Before you get the license to anything at all, you have to go through a certain test. So let's consider the life of eternity as our reward. Being Christ-like is a reward. So what are the tests that we have to go through? It's perhaps little quizzes in life, like lining up at the cafeteria and not cutting someone's line. <laughs> or maybe during enrollment, you know, God wants to develop patience in us. We pray, Lord, make me patient. And then you got that long line in DSF, and you're hungry, and you're like, hey, friend, could you, like, stay here for a while while I go get some food? And, you know, I'm going to share with you later. So just, you know, reserve your line number. Or perhaps, like, walking all the way from AUP gate to your dormitory, and it's hot, it's midday, you're tired, and you just want to rest, and you start getting, like, irritated, and you're like, ah. Uh, if only AUP had like free service, you know, like give us some ride. Well, those are the things that I thought of when I was like back in college. But then I realized it's one of the ways that God keeps me healthy. Walking is good. So, yeah, let's practice that. Because when you go out into your field, especially if you're in office, you're going to be sitting down a lot and you don't want that to happen. But anyway. God sees potential in you that he wants you to realize yourself. 
So let's read this. If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time defining us. Go on. He does not cast worthless stones into his furnace. It is valuable ore that he refines and the blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know what manner of metal they are. So this is the training that God puts us into. Go on. It says here, the Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction to prove what temper they are, they are of, and whether they can be fashioned for his work. Many of us here are like hard up, steel bent, and God wants to build us up into something. Um, to the fine art students, we usually give them an activity like wire forming something. And you're aware to our students that there needs to be pressure in order for you to, you know, put piece together the wires to create something. And perhaps to those in the music department, you know that you have to practice a lot before you can master a piece, right? In the same way, God is writing a very beautiful composition for each one of us. But the thing is, are we willing to submit ourselves and allow Him to play His melody in our lives? Are we willing to allow Him to shape us, to mold us to who He wants us to be? There's a video that I'd like to show to you guys. And take note of the words that are going to be mentioned. Are the clay. You are the potter. We are all works in your hands. Did he ever leave it? Did he like, okay, you know, I'm going to leave you there, and then when you look okay, when you're fine already, I'm going to come back to you. All right? In every step of the way, no matter what heat that pot went into, the potter was there. He never left that pot. He was watching. That's the same thing for us. God will not leave us in the fire. Perhaps for some of us, He might leave us in the fire for a little longer so that the impurities may be burnt out. 
However, he will not leave us. Although you may not know him or sense him or feel him, he's there. And this is the last point that I want to make. Who you become and who you come to know matters more. What do we mean by this? The person that you become in the process of that refinement is of more value to God. At the same time, when you come to know Christ more, your life is basically going to turn out better. The Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. That's in Isaiah 26, verse 3. Whose mind is stayed on you. Does that mean there are no problems in life? No. But it just means that someone has chosen to take their focus off the problems in life and look at Christ. Someone has chosen to take the minds of the things that bother them, that irritate them, and fasten them upon Christ. The Bible promises you will keep in perfect peace the mind that is stayed on you. Yes, we have requirements. Yes, we have things to do. But these shouldn't, you know, put us down to the point where we become hopeless, to the point where we become discouraged. Because as I've read, a discouraged Christian is an easy prey for Satan. A discouraged Christian basically is weak. However, the Bible also does say that when we are weak, then he is strong. That is if we go to him for help. Sometimes we may even come to the point where there's no one we can go to but God. And when we've come to the point that we have no hope but in God alone, that's when God becomes more personal to us. There was a point in my life where I'm like, Lord, you know, no one cares. No one understands what I'm going through, all the trauma I've been through in life. Why did you allow that to happen? You could have stopped whoever did that and, you know, just spared me all the pain. But what did I learn from that experience? I learned that God understands my pain. God understands your pain. God understands that you're having a hard time. But at the same time, He assures you that He will be with you. There's a promise in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now the version says... For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that is vast, that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. And last, these little troubles are getting us ready for what? An earthly glory. For a five-year glory says for an eternal glory that will make all our troubles seem like nothing so this is the hope that we have these things that are happening to us are temporary you know no one stays in the same position they are as they were five years ago who you were then is not who you are now at the same time if you keep walking with God who you are now oh my goodness Imagine what God can do through you. The lives that will be saved, the lives that will be touched because of your influence. So here we are again. Let me summarize all the points that were made. The first, trials are what? God's agents for change. Second, God sees potential in you that no one else can. And the third, who you become and who you come to know matters more. So I'd like to close with this verse. And we know that all things, when we say all things, is, is it just the good ones? No. Is it just the happy times? <coughs> No. Is it just the times I'm with my family and the ones that I love and the ones that love me? No. 
everything, all our experiences are for whose good? For our good. For the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So if you were to ask this question again, maybe when things get hard, this is the answer that Jesus has for you. You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. What matters is we keep walking with Christ, we keep beholding Christ. And no matter what comes into our life, let's recall that verse, that promise, that all things will work together for our good. God has a wonderful plan for each one of us. As we had watched in the video earlier, I know the plans I have for you. Are we willing to take time to be with God, to understand what His plans are, and to carry them into action? So why me, Lord, if you were to ask that? Why not? God bless us all. Corinthians 9, uh, verse 7, I will be reading from T. James Version.